Mainstream media exists for the purposes of indoctrination and manipulation of public perception. The world of free and independent media is growing, and with the upsurge in information now available in the public domain, it has never been easier to access free and independent media. The exploration of this information resulted in an experimental project which would provide a fully supported space for researchers, whistleblowers, and seekers of all kinds to express themselves and educate the world. On the 1st of January 2015, Conscious Consumer Network was launched to the world. Nobody thought we would make it this far, but CCN is the longest running free and independent media network of its kind. CCN is a unique collaboration of hearts and souls bringing you information from different perspectives to educate and inform. Since we started CCN, we have had only one desire, the pursuit of a free, fair, just, sustainable world, and this has not changed. Having overcome many challenges over the last two years, CCN is here to stay, and we've got great things lined up for 2017. It's all it's right all to be right. just a little bit crazy. Being, being creative, creative is being a little bit crazy in just the right vibration. With that, With that in mind, mind you, should you should understand God's completely God. insane. An educational comedy. It's not a cause, not a movement. Not a social group you can slap a label on to. It's an idea. It's an intention. It's an intuition. A mindset in which reality can be explored. It's a genuine expression. A certain critical thinking and imagination. To look inward upon ourselves. To better understand the external world around us. And yes, feeding those are bound to be bruised. With our silly, thingy, politically incorrect, George Carlin Gilbert style of going about things. Real, Real and words. raw honesty. Which invites you to be you to the fullest. Although some people are awake, there still seems to me that I know this is controversial, so I'm just going to say it right out. <laughs> you put your passion, you're not awake. That's that's what I yeah. do. Okay, you can't claim to be an awake and aware person and lack compassion. So, for example, yes, there are people, you know, um, and, and, and there's there's lots to be said about this and that and the next. But there's compassionate ways in which to go about it rather than attacking. And we as a society, and I've noticed this program, and it's so sad because you've got a lot of these truth move, um, truth uh, speakers, truth seekers waking up, coming into this movement, and you know, jumping into the communication mix on various social media platforms, and they've got what I call the Jesuit punitive programming. Okay, which is um, if someone's done something bad, you know, wah, 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 they must be punished, even if it's a verbal lashing. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm thinking that it really is about isolating this punitive aspect of our thinking of, you know, um, 
damage and retribution. You know, if, if you're in pain, you've got to seek vengeance kind of thing. And there is very much this thing inside the human psyche. Um, and I suppose it does take a lot of uh, calm, discipline, I don't know, yogi awareness, whatever you want to call it, a, you know, certain silence, whatever you have to do to rid yourself of that anger and come to a place where, you know, even though you've been hurt, you don't project your pain onto others. Rather, you show compassion and empathy for the pain of others because you've suffered too. Yeah. That for me is awareness. Okay, it's not you know uh, let's get our pitchforks out and let's go you know kill these guys because they're yeah. bad. Don't forget the don't forget the fake positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm I'm positive. See, don't you dare tell me otherwise, or you're of a low frequency. <laughs> Energy is attached to you. If you tell me I'm not positive, oh. you know <laughs> exactly. Is that, I get this all the time with where people say, oh, why do you focus on such negative stuff? Because you know a lot of the work we do is exposing the darkness. And I love your what you said there. It's not that I, I focus on the darkness. I'm a very happy, positive person because guess what? I shine light into dark places. For me, that's a positive, positive, positive. That's not a negative, negative, negative. It is absolutely about putting positive into a bad situation to manifest a positive outcome, which hopefully is awareness of the situation. Yeah, totally, totally. Humanity lives in the sunlit world of what we believe to be reality. There is, however, unseen by most. The military-industrial conflict. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. Wanting to know the truth requires risking what you already have and what you're already comfortable with, which is why most people don't want to know the truth. We came, we saw, <laughs> he died. <laughs> and just really brainwashed people. This really stems from the fact that our society seems to have this trend of making the population feel like crap and then making money off of it in some way. I mean, you can see this anywhere from cosmetics to weight loss industry to big pharma and selling medicine for depression. They prescribe shit. The title of my talk today is Removing Mental Malware. Malware as in computer malware, where somebody writes a program and sticks it on their computer by way of a virus or something. It'll be the mental version of that. Step one is, do you want to know the truth? If you really want to know the truth, that requires you to put everything you believe at risk, to question everything you assume, to question everything you think you've already figured out. We believe what we're taught. We believe what we hear everyone around us telling us, what our teachers tell us, what our parents tell us, what the community around us tells us. You may have some pet theory, some conspiracy theory, or some weird theory that other people think are weird. And if you found out the truth, you might find you were actually wrong, that your theory was bogus. And if you're not open to that possibility, then you're not really going for the truth. On the other hand, there may be somebody who says, well, I believe what the mainstream believes, and I believe what everyone around me believes, and I'm not going to consider anything that sounds unusual or weird. They want to know the truth either. Wanting to know the truth requires risking what you already have and what you're already comfortable with, which is why most people don't want to know the truth. Assuming you actually want to know the truth, how do you get there? By using the scientific method or the scientific process. I'm a huge fan of the scientific process. I think it's the only way to reach rational conclusions. However, I'm also a huge critic of a lot of people who stick the label scientist on themselves. The scientific process, in a nutshell, is you take in evidence, you take in data, and from it you try to extrapolate an explanation of reality, or pieces of reality. 
You try to get a worldview that actually matches the world outside of you. And sometimes you find out, whoops, well, that data made it look like this, and now this data makes it. And so you have to test your theories and sometimes wear them out. A lot of people who wear the label scientists and pretend they like science, what they do is take in a lot of evidence, look at the stuff that already fits what they already believe, and the other stuff, that's just weird. We're, we're going to pretend that didn't happen. So by the scientific process, I don't mean come to the results that are now usually labeled under science. I mean the actual scientific process of look at the world, take in all the evidence you can, and then try to figure out reality from that. Even if the evidence is weird and disturbing and goes against what you already want. Another problem that stops people from using the scientific process is when it starts to point at a conclusion that they don't like. They will often bail out. If you start to see a rational examination of the evidence pointing towards you were totally wrong about something, most people will bail out around the other way because they're invested in what they already believe in. Now this is especially true if it's something you believed in your whole life, you've worked on, maybe if you've devoted your career to something and somebody comes along and says, I want you to consider this and rationally look at the evidence and find out that your entire career was based on a gigantic lie. There's a huge motivation to not look at that, to not use the scientific process. That's what each one of us has to look out for inside our own heads. Are there any walls we put up because we think, I don't really like where that evidence and logic is leading me, I'm just going to kind of stick a wall there and pretend I didn't see that. That's the comfortable easy thing. There are lots of conclusions people don't want to reach. There are lots and lots of conspiracy theories, and when people say conspiracy theory, they're usually bashing it, and what they usually mean is, I don't want to consider the possibility that the explanation for this event that happened is something that's really going to creep me out. So I'm going to call it a conspiracy theory. That is not scientific and that is not rational. When you have things happen like what happened in Boston and 9-11, I don't even bother telling people what I think very often or arguing the evidence. I just go to people and say, did you look at this evidence? Did you approach this wanting to know what happened? Or did you approach this determined that this will be the conclusion you reach no matter what? And that's most people because most people don't want to know the truth. And the only people who ever move it forward are the ones who say, yeah, I want to know the whole truth. It might be unpleasant and it might totally mess up my view of the world and might mess up my life and everything else, but uh, yeah, truth's got to come first. Assuming we want to know the truth and assuming we know the scientific process, why do we come to so many different conclusions? What messes things up for us? Checking for warped perceptions. The primary problem in the world is not greed and it is not hatred and it is not malice. It's the fact that people's perception of reality is hugely twisted by things they're taught, by things they hear all around them, their upbringing. I think it's pretty self-evident that if you have one huge group of people who means well and wants truth and justice to prevail and sees reality as it is, and another huge group of people who wants truth and justice to prevail and they see reality as it is, they probably wouldn't be trying to murder each other. Which means the underlying problem in every war is not the hatred, even though there's obvious surface animosity while they're trying to kill each other. It's warping of perceptions. At least one side, and I would say both sides every time, their perceptions have been warped such that they think trying to kill that other guy is necessary for humanity. And the guy over there thinks trying to kill them is necessary for humanity. And if the one side or both sides whose perceptions were mangled could fix their own perceptions, the war stops. Because they suddenly realize, okay, you think you're the good guy and I think I'm the good guy. If we both understand reality, we'll probably stop killing each other. The problem is, this is something I refer to as mental lenses. Things that are inside our head that warp the way we see the world. Everybody thinks he sees the world as it is. It's impossible not to. You think you see reality, you think you have a pretty good grip on reality. There, there may be things you say, well, I don't know about this and I don't know about that, but I have a general grasp on what's going on. Nobody thinks his own perception is messed up. Now, everybody can point to all sorts of other people. And pointing out that somebody else is delusional 
doesn't make them not delusional, even if they are. The only thing that moves humanity forward is if somebody dares to look inside their own head and say, are there things that are messing up my perception of reality and making me do stupid stuff? Because the only one you can actually change is yourself. Unfortunately, most people would much rather shoot at other people than say, maybe my belief system is based on some bogus ideas. So for the past 10,000 years or whatever, we've just been killing each other because I'd rather kill you than think about my own paradigm. Not a good situation, but it is changing with events like this. Why would our perceptions be warped? When I talk about mental malware, I mean stuff that was put there intentionally to mess you up. Most of what we believe is passed on to us from our parents, our teachers, our friends, people around us, our society as a whole, the media, all the things we're exposed to. I do not believe that everybody out there telling a lie is trying to tell a lie. I believe the vast majority are just passing on lies that they were taught because they don't know any better. When parents teach their children stupid things that they learn, they're not thinking, ha ha, I'm gonna get my kids for this one. They think they're the same reality to the next generation. When teachers teach the same garbage that they were taught that's untrue and based on a bunch of false paradigms, they're not trying to be nasty, they're just passing on their own misunderstanding. And this is why, number one, is important, we have to want to know the truth. Because if someone who cares about you and loves you is telling you this and they sound so sure of themselves, the hardest thing in the world is to think, well, you know, Maybe you're totally wrong, Mom and Dad. You know, I know you mean well, I don't think you're trying to fake me out, but I think you and everyone around me might be totally wrong about this. You know, another reason people don't want the truth is if you're the only one who believes something, it's really uncomfortable. I suspect people in this crowd know that a lot more than the general public. Not being in the majority is an uncomfortable place to be, which tends to push us into a majority that all can feel confident that together they believe the wrong destructive things. For the purpose of this talk, what matters is getting it out of your head. Those of you who know about the, the Prussian indoctrination system and like John Taylor Gatto's work, you can very much see the openly admitted intentional design of programming people to be easily controlled and, and unthinking machines. It doesn't even matter if you got these warped perceptions by way of misinformed but benevolent sources or actual psychos trying to control you because either way if they're stuck in, in your head and messing with your perception then they need to be fixed the primary example of malware that i talk about is the malware revolving around concepts of government and law and politics and authority and crime and all the terminology and all the thought processes that tentacles come out from the belief in authority. It's really easy to point to some bad guy, to point to some tyrant, to point to some regime and say, that's the problem, they're scary, they're bad, let's go do something about them. The main problem isn't the bad guys. The bad guys will keep being bad guys. The main problem is the power they get from the warping up the perceptions of their victims. And if you fix the perception of their victims, the control freaks don't have any power anymore. Everybody believes in government. They believe it's real, they believe in the law, they believe in authority, and they have all these perceptions that they think are based on reality. That is a great sign that you have somebody controlling what's in here. But if you're convinced that it's law and it's government and it's authority, literally people feel profound moral guilt at doing something that doesn't hurt anybody but disobeys the group of people who claim to be government, who claim to have the right to rule. I love the term law-abiding taxpayer because it's people proudly displaying their malware for all the world to see. <laughs> I am proud that I give my money to a bunch of crooks and I do whatever they tell me. Law-abiding taxpayer. That is all it means. Lots and lots of history is good people who are taught to believe the lie of authority either just spectating and doing nothing or actively helping to dominate, oppress, or even kill their fellow man because authority told them to. And that's what I mean by the fact that the problem is not the psychos. 
There's only one reason we know the name Adolf Hitler, and it wasn't because of Adolf Hitler. It was because lots of people in Germany believed in the thing called authority. And so if the guy is in a certain position and has a certain job description, and he tells you to do something, well, you do it. You follow orders, you enforce the law. If they didn't believe that, what could one goofball with a stupid mustache possibly have done on his own? Same thing everywhere. Red China, Soviet Union, you can go anywhere you want. The mass oppression was not because all the individuals doing it thought, you know, today I just want to go hurt somebody. It's because they were raised with the malware of authoritarianism and government and law and all these concepts that go together so that they literally feel guilty about doing what they know is right. But Stanley Milgram did experiments which totally show that this applies to Americans as much as anybody else. We know what is right and wrong, and we will do the wrong thing if a perceived authority tells us to. That's the horrendous punchline. And I highly suggest everybody go check out this. It should be required. People should be forced to read that book. Stanley Milgram's book is called Obedience to Authority, and it goes all through his experiments, which is really creepy, but it's an outstanding expose on mental malware and the destruction it leads to uh, making good people do really nasty evil stuff. Even inside the freedom movement, because the malware is so lodged in most people's heads, even the vast majority of people say, I want freedom, they don't recognize their own malware. They don't even check for it. Because they think, the problem's in Washington, D.C. Those guys are bad guys. And yeah, they are bad guys, but they're not the problem. And we have to go do something to that. And whenever that's the focus, you lose, because you miss the underlying problem of the world. The entire idea that we have to do something to the ruling class, whether it's we have to vote in people who will sit back and go petition them, we have to go have a protest, we have to have a revolution. <clears throat> there is nothing you can do to the control freaks who pretend to be government that will fix reality. As long as that malware is in their heads, it doesn't matter what you do to the current ruling class. Elections and petitions, even revolutions, they're pointless because that isn't the problem. If the problem is inside your head, shooting somebody in Washington isn't going to fix it. But if you imagine a world in which the malware is gone and tomorrow 300 million people wake up and say, I don't really feel a need to give a bunch of my money to them. In fact, I don't feel a need to use their crummy currency that keeps going down in value. I don't feel the moral obligation to obey their arbitrary stupid commands and I definitely don't want to fuel their war machine in their police state. So, man, yeah, yeah, cool. Now, if one person does that, out come the jackboots and he gets stomped and killed and thrown in the cage. If 300 million do it, we're done. The end. As long as you're focused on doing something to the rulers, nothing fixes because they're not the problem. And all of their power comes from the malware in our heads, our perceptions that they have the right to do this, that their commands are law, that when they say, give me money, it isn't robbery, it's taxation. These ideas in the heads of the victims are the problem. But what it comes down to is when people understand the malware, it goes away. Don't be scared of chaos and anarchy. Be scared of the guy who says, put me in charge, I will fix the world. He is not your master. You.
the great benefit for me in calling out to the universe after I recognized I had really done whatever I knew to do and still there was this force of suffering that was alive in me. Stop trying to escape. Stop trying to be somebody. Stop trying to get away. Stop trying to get something. Stop trying to keep something away. It actually means be still. But the mind here is be still and corrupts it into meditation practice. As valuable as meditation practices are, and they are extremely valuable. But that's not what this is. It's not a practice. It's a moment of the deepest inquiry. into the mechanism that's running the show. And in order to inquire into that mechanism, there has to be a willingness for the show to stop. And that's rare, or has been rare. It needn't to be rare, but it has been rare. Because we have relied on the show to give us what it is we think we want. You may still want more, but you've gotten enough to know it's hollow. And that's extraordinary. To inquire really deeply into the lie, into the truth that is under the lie. It's under each lie. The truth is alive. It really hasn't gone anywhere. Under all of that is this depth of seriousness. What is your life about? And as a human being already, there is a privilege in the developed brain and the capacity to reflect and remember and play back and see moments of choice, moments of lying, moments of truth, and inquire deeper to see and experience the motivation. And it's your time to discover that. And it's your choice. And it's your choice to give everything to that discovery or keep some back or trivialize it or say yes or say maybe. It's all, it's all your choice. It's choiceless that it has arisen in you, that somehow you and not your neighbor or your sister or your brother or whoever somehow it arose in you. It called you somehow, whether you wanted it to or didn't want it to, whether you thought it was craziness or whether you thought it was enlightenment.
it's, it's a mystery. Maybe it's random. My teacher, Papa G, says it's just good luck, that's all. It's good luck. It just doesn't feel good for most of your life. Because <laughs> it's not normal. It doesn't look like what you thought good luck would look like. You thought it would go away if you fed it enough stuff or accomplishments or successes or self-esteem. It, it won't go away until you meet it all the way. And so my role in your life is absolutely not to make you more comfortable in escaping your good luck, but to assist you in diving into it until you drown in it. Until you just are the luck itself. so huge to recognize that we are nothing. <laughs> really huge. I mean, it sounds good until you get close to it. And then it's like, oh no, really? Really nothing. And the mind immediately equates that with non-existence. It's not a correct equation, but that's what that's what the mind does, of course. Nothing equals non-existence. If I am nothing, if I'm not somebody, that therefore means I do not exist. The truth is, what doesn't exist is who you think you are. It doesn't exist. It's all a lie. The good parts and the bad parts. And who you think everybody else is, too. It's all made up. It's the power of imagination. And it's wondrous in its own right, but regarding the truth of the matter. It doesn't in reality exist. And because of our identification with who we think we are, we assume if that doesn't exist, then I doesn't exist. But I is in fact existence that all of the stories and the forms and the made-upness appear and disappear in. And so when the form of you disappears, I remain. Let us not think in terms of principles and ideals, but be concerned with things as they are. For it is the consideration of what is that awakens intelligence. And the intelligence of the educator is far more important than his knowledge of a new method of education. When one follows a method, even if it has been worked out by a thoughtful and intelligent person, the method becomes very important, and the children and teachers are important only as they fit into it. One measures and classifies the child and teaches, and then proceeds to educate him according to some chart. This process of education may be convenient for the teacher, school boards and administrators, but neither the practice of a system nor the tyranny of opinion and learning can bring about an integrated human being. A man history records as being instrumental in the creation of America's public education system. 
Horace Mann was an American educator who served as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, part of the American Congress. Horace Mann was the key reformer of the education system at the time. In 1837, he became the head of the newly created Board of Education in Massachusetts, where he began the work that would eventually earn him the title as the father of American public education. After reading through the educational models of different countries, Mann finally hears about a particularly successful style that had been developed in Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany. The Prussian system had shown to be such a success for the government's purposes that, accompanied by a few other educators, Horace Mann travels to Germany to investigate. Upon their return to the United States, they lobbied heavily to have the Prussian model adopted. All in favor say aye. Interest in Prussia had also been growing in the northern half of the continent. Around this time, the Canadian superintendent of schools, Egerton Ryerson, traveled to Prussia in search of a new model of education. His journeys also included visiting Horace Mann in Massachusetts to further examine the system he would eventually adopt. George Brown, the editor of Toronto's Globe newspaper, was even quoted saying that Ryerson had successfully imported Prussian education into Ontario. During the next 30 years or so, a whole line of American dignitaries came to Germany to earn degrees. Interestingly enough, those who earned degrees in Germany came back to the United States to staff all the major universities. By 1900, all the PhDs in the United States were trained in Prussia. As the first secretary of the State Board of Education, Horace Mann promoted his new concept that the state is the father of children. He stressed that it was the responsibility of the state to ensure that education was provided for the child. A very noble idea, of course, but what exactly did he mean by that? And how did he define education? It seems like a very broad subject. It is a very broad subject. Education encompasses all of human history and all the knowledge we have gathered during that time. Not to mention, and perhaps most importantly, what we as human beings learn over our lifetime on a personal level. Horace Mann's 10th annual report in 1846 led to the first state law that made it mandatory for children to go to school. It was during that year that he supported the governor of Massachusetts in adopting the Prussian model of education for the entire state. How did he do that? The governor of the time, Edward Everett, as it turns out, was the very first to receive a PhD from... can you guess where? That's right, Prussia. From then on it spread very quickly. Just after Everett installed the Prussian model in the state of Massachusetts, the governor of New York set up the very same method in 12 New York schools. Horace Mann's sister, Elizabeth Peabody, of the Peabody Foundation, saw to it that right after the Civil War, the Prussian system that was then being taught in the northern states was integrated into the conquered south. By 1900, most of the compulsory schooling laws that implemented the new system had been passed. From then on, every American child grew up under the Prussian system. So what exactly was the Prussian education system that everyone thought was so amazing that it just had to be adopted throughout the free world? To give you just a bit of background, in the 18th century, the Kingdom of Prussia, which is now modern-day Germany, was among the first countries of the world to introduce free and compulsory education. After the Prussians were defeated by Napoleon in 1806, it was decided that the reason why the battle was lost was that the Prussian soldiers were thinking for themselves in the battlefield instead of following orders. To make sure that this couldn't happen again, a new eight-year system of schooling was created. This new system provided not only the skills needed for the early industrialized world, such as reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also a strict education that taught duty, discipline, respect for authority, and the ability to follow orders. Elite children destined for higher offices went on to attend private schools, while the rest of the population had no access to the secondary education. They were destined for the working class. Through this new system, the Prussian court tried to create social obedience in the citizens through indoctrination. Every individual had to become convinced at the core of their being that the king was just, his decisions were always right, and the need for obedience paramount. In truth, the entire purpose of the system was to instill loyalty to the crown and to train young men for the military and bureaucracy. To do this, it was necessary to squeeze out all independent thinking from the masses. Influencing this new system from the beginning was Prussian philosopher Johann Gottlieb Fitch. Combining John Locke's view that the children are a blank slate and Rousseau's ideas on how to write on that slate, 
Prosser established an educational system that was considered scientific in nature. An important part of the Prussian system was that it defined for the child what was to be learned, what was to be thought about, and how long to think about it. In order to have an efficient policy-making class and a subclass beneath it, it was believed that one had to remove the power of most people to make sense out of the available information. In other words, critical thinking had to be done away with. Now, if you're wondering why the average person doesn't know that the North American education system is based directly on the Prussian model, it might just be because its original purpose was not designed for the good of the individual, but for the good of the government. The philosophy of Johann Fitch directly influenced the creation of the Prussian model of schooling. As he is quoted saying, The schools must fashion the person, and fashion him in such a way that he simply cannot will otherwise than what you wish him to will. With quotes like these, you can see why his involvement is not well known. Education should aim at destroying free will, so that after pupils are thus schooled, they will be incapable throughout the rest of their lives of thinking or acting otherwise than as their schoolmasters would have wished. When this technique has been perfected, every government that has been in charge of education for more than one generation will be able to control its subjects securely without the need of armies or policemen. In 1807, in a Berlin occupied by Napoleon, Johann Fitch gave a series of famous addresses to the German nation. Fitch spoke of the superiority of German people above all others. The content of these speeches was a catalyst for the Prussian education system and German nationalism. In other earlier works, he calls Jews a state within a state that would, quote, undermine the German nation. He openly expressed a desire to expel Jews from Germany. Fitch had a deep influence on the rise of the Third Reich and continues to be deemed, quote, the spiritual father of modern neo-Nazism. Which begs the question, why would the father of American education make it a law that every child spend their youth in a system created by the father of neo-Nazism? Historians reflect that one of the greatest social factors that allowed a man like Hitler to rise to power was that the German people had been bred from birth to respect authority above all else and accept it without question. Which begs another question, if the entire population of North America is raised in a system adopted from pre-Nazi Germany, what are we setting ourselves up for? All you have to do, all American mass media has to do, is to unplug their bananas from their ears, open up their eyes, and they can see it. There is no mystery, there is nothing to do with espionage. I know that espionage intelligence gathering looks more romantic. It sells more deodorants through the advertising, probably. That's why your Hollywood producers are so crazy about James Bond type of, of, of thrillers. But in reality, the main emphasis of the KGB is not in the area of intelligence at all. According to my uh, opinion and opinion of many defectors of my caliber, only about 15% of time, money and manpower is spent on espionage as such. The other 85% is a slow process which we call either ideological subversion or active measures, active мероприятия in the language of the KGB, or psychological warfare. What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process which goes very slow and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The demoralization process in the United States is basically completed already. Uh, for the last 25 years, actually it's over fulfilled because uh, demoralization now reaches such areas where previously not even Comrade Andropov and, and all his experts would, would even dream of such a tremendous success 
Most of it is done by Americans to Americans, thanks to lack of moral standards. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. So the next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flat, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation. Uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials. Economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense and economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. You can see it in, in Central America now. And after crisis, with a violent change of, of power, structure and economy, you have so-called the period of normalization. It may last indefinitely. Normalization is a cynical expression borrowed from Soviet propaganda. When the Soviet tanks moved into Czechoslovakia in 68, Comrade Brezhnev said, now the situation in brotherly Czechoslovakia is normalized. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis, to promise people all kinds of goodies and the paradise on earth. Uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition and to put a big brother government in Washington DC with uh, benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfilled or not. Your leftists in, in the United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, they, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. But they may turn into the most bitter enemies of Marxist-Leninists when they come to power. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. You remember most of these uh, former Marxist-Leninists were either put to prison or one of them split and now he's working against Sandinistas. It happened in, in uh, uh, Grenada when Maurice Bishop was, he was already a Marxist. He was executed by, by a new Marxist who was more Marxist than this Marxist. Same happened in Afghanistan when uh, first there was Taraki, he was killed by Amin, then Amin was killed by Babrak Karmal with the help of KGB. Same happened in, in Bangladesh when Mujibur Rahman, very pro-Soviet leftist, was assassinated by his own Marxist-Leninist military comrades. It's the same pattern everywhere. It's divided in, in four basic stages. Demoralization, destabilization, crisis, normalization. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. to move through and overcome the the abundant shock that you know basically that a lot of people don't overcome it because you know they have this um 
this avoidance uh, reflex. They get frustrated and, and, and they, they avoid. Um, but it's, it would be better to realize that there's a part of ourselves that does, that in order to make something real, um, requires this rite of passage or this hazing or this, this initiation and that the self abuse as counterintuitive as this might sound, the set, the self abuse can actually be, be used to move out of the self abuse and, um, to better, you know, be able to accept, you know, better, more positive things. Because, you know, when you've beaten the shit out of that proverbial wall enough times that you see it is still standing, um, then that's a solid reality for you at that point. You've done it enough to where you could say, okay, well, that's what this is, and that's solid, and that's stable, so now I can believe in the stability of this reality. Because the whole abundant shock thing and being used to the comfort zones, the opposite of that is thinking, oh, if it's not in my comfort zone, then it's not stable. Even if it's nice, even if it's wonderful, there's no way it can last. It's not stable. It's going to collapse like a house of cards. So it's better to just, you know, avoid the good things and remain in the suffering that I'm used to because... If I embrace the good things, I'm going to be even more hurt. Well, the way yeah. through, the way through it is to to face the good things in a way that satisfies your addiction to suffering. So instead of avoiding the good things, embrace them. Let yourself have the level of suffering that you're used to while doing it. You know, beat the living crap out of that positive thing for as long as you need to to make sure that it's <laughs> stable and that it's not going anywhere. And then when your mind can be completely, fully, logically satisfied that you've met your suffering requirements, then and only then, in that last desperate act of surrendering upon the realization that, okay, maybe this good, positive thing might be fitting into my comfort zone after all. Then and only then will you accept it. Yeah. I mean, hey, you've seen me go through that process so many times. We've all gone through that process, I think. Yeah. Right now, Kristen's going through that process. Right now, Rochelle is going through that process hardcore. Right now, Richard is going through that process. Um, you're going through that process. Paul's going through that process. And I'm I'm going through like this, like I, all these different themes throughout this year of discovery. I've been having like this weird inversion thing going on. Because like, even though... I've, 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 I personally have cleared a lot of this stuff. One of the old sticky paradigms is that, oh, well, if I've cleared it, but everybody else around me hasn't, then, then that's a threat to me that it's going to take my nice new positive place and collapse it and turn it into a nightmare. So uh -huh. I've gotten to watch everybody else around me go through all, all this stuff so that I can face the idea that, okay, even surrounded by all this chaos in the eye of this storm, I can still be me. I can look at it and, and see what about my own old paradigms that that reflects. And then that forces me to face it and decide what I want to do with it. Because, you know, it's, it, it, it's, uh, I've already gone through the process of facing all these different paradigms that all of you were facing, but what people don't understand, the bigger challenge is that it, it's, it's a two-sided coin. Like, you know, all those paradigms are one side, and we tend to ignore the other side. It's kind of like a really new agey thing to do. Like, okay, I, I've got this, so I'm going to shun the fucking dark now. You know what I mean? Like, I'm I'm in my spiritual empowerment. By empowerment, I mean narcissism. <clears throat> anyway, so, you know, it's just like, th that's an easy trap to fall into. So it's like... Now I'm I'm being faced with that other side of the coin that like most people run from or go into denial of or try to avoid or don't even want to believe it's there. So I'm like I'm facing that other side of the coin. You know, Rochelle's put up a, a full wall and I'm the thing I'm facing is that okay, she has the right to do that and beat herself up and you know totally reject all of this so that she could see after she comes out of it, after she runs out of of energy to fight it that she still sees that no matter how many times she's punched it that it's still there it's still strong it's still stable and 
she needs to go through that and it doesn't mean that I failed or I've done anything wrong or I'm a horrible friend or whatever. Um, just people are going to do what they're going to do. And if that's what she requires of herself to, to see that she's worthy of the good, positive things in her life, not just my friendship, but lots of other things that she's looked at and gone, oh my God, am I even deserving and worthy of this? Can I handle this? Then if she needs to beat the shit out of all that to, to see that it's all still remaining standing after all is said and done, then... You know, I've had to go through processes like that in my life. I had to go go through hell in the face of the positive in order to see that the positive still remains a standing when the, when the dust settles. Otherwise, it, it just wasn't going to be real for me. And Rochelle's going through that. And Richard is, you know, is facing a lot of things lately, especially, you know, when it comes to his relations with, with females and seeing that you know, he, he can face all these paradigms inside himself and have his external reality reflect these various issues and that when he stands strong in it, that, you know, all is well and the dust settles and everything's still all good. So what have you both been, been facing lately? I mean, I know the answer to that question, but for the viewing audience, tell us. Oh, well, uh, so we've been facing issues with, um, completely transcending one salary level going to another one we just moved over here to maui and um that this was the hawaiian island that scared the crap out of us it was the one that we denied ourselves for a while first when we came over to hawaii we we're like well, we can go to hawaii but we can't go to the best island we have to go to like the, the, the third best island <laughs> so going to the big island and um i know the third best is in like they're objectively better than each other but the one that was like the least likely for us to enjoy. We went to that one first. It was the one that was in, we went over to uh, Oahu, which is where Honolulu is, and it was entirely a fear-based. Like, you're you're oh, starting. You're you're over. starting yeah. to get. You're starting to get kind of mumbly and and garbly. So move back from the phone hey, a little bit. So, yes. Yeah, so it, well, there uh, there's such a thing as too close to the phone, just as there is such a thing as too far from it. I see. Well, let's find the Goldilocks. Fine. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, anyways, there we, we go. Right there is perfect. Finally, this is good. Yeah, that's good. Awesome. So we are finally in a place where we wanted to be in the first place and wouldn't allow ourselves to have for almost a year. And is uh, it has definitely been bringing up a whole bunch of our own abundant shock stuff, whereby we are. Uh, insisting on being miserable and being afraid of the boogeyman in the closet, even though everything is working out really well. So today I went and bought a whole bunch of clothes for my new job because I have a, a killer new job that I'm very happy about, about uh, having landed. And I mean, objectively, it was a great day. I, I picked up a wardrobe that was probably about a $500 wardrobe for less less than three hundred dollars like two hundred seventy dollars and everybody that everybody that we talked to today was just so friendly and we kept like everything literally everything that i bought was on sale you have eighty dollar pair of shoes for thirty bucks. yeah i got an eighty dollar pair of shoes for thirty dollars they're it's cheaper than the thrift store and it's brand new i don't pay, i don't really I, don't, I, don't pay, I don't pay retail for anything so i love it when that happens mm -hmm. right exactly so and and I found that Katharina and I were getting really snippy with each other halfway through this awesomeness. <laughs> because we're, and we're starting to have ourselves a little argument about stupid stuff that it was really just going, you know, we were both, we were both being victimized by our own paradigms and we thought we were doing it to each other. <laughs> <laughs> so it was very interesting to observe that. And so what we did is we went out to a local beach and we just like sat there and ate some fruit and prayed and kind of recentered ourselves and um, realized that it was really just our our own our own internal thermometers that were saying wait all this really good stuff is happening so the shoes are going to drop <laughs> right now we have to have a fight we can't have a relationship and get really good deal on clothes <laughs> and have a good job and have a good life like you got to fit Oh God, me, me, and me and Cat, me and Katarina also went through our fair share of that sort of thing within our friendship as well. 
the better things got, mm -hmm. there had to be these moments of, of drama in, in order for in order for us to to not feel completely outside of our comfort zones. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because you're taught all during your your childhood that 